means drum. So that's why we don't say we do taiko drumming, because that's like drum drumming. <laughs> and taiko is a Japanese type of drumming, and it was typically done at festivals. Well, our name Nendaiko, uh, Daiko is the Japanese the adjustment, right, for Taiko, which is the instrument. Uh, the Nen character was given to us by our founding minister at the time when we started. And it comes from the term Nenbutsu, which is one of the terms in our practice of Buddhism. I've been a member of Nen Daiko um, full time since 1999. Uh, the group started in 1994. That was the year I left for college. In Fairfax Station, there's a temple that is called Ikoji Buddhist Temple, and the group started there as an activity for the young people. The group has developed, so it's no longer strictly a temple activity. Our members come from within our Sangha in our temple, but also without. Uh, we have Buddhists in our Sangha in our group, and we have non-Buddhists in our group. Uh, the thing that joins us together is just an interest and a willingness and to learn from each other and to push each other to improve as artists, as musicians. There's this thing we do called ki-eyeing, where we go ah, oh, like that, and we make sounds. And that's partially to encourage the other drummers, but it's also to give our energy to the audience. The group is not about one person, right? And not, no one person is bigger than the group. Uh, and we, we function together, we function best when we play together. As an adult, we have a lot of things to be worried about, right? There's always issues, you're trying to advance your career, you're trying to be a good parent. Um, when I'm playing taiko, I'm just thinking about taiko, and I'm thinking about giving as much energy to the drum and to my fellow players and to the audience as I can fathom giving. And it just, it's like you focus in on just being, and so yeah, I, I love that feeling. Hello, I am Martha Watanabe, Chair of the Freedom Walk Committee. Welcome to the National Japanese American Memorial to Patriotism during World War II. Traditionally, this is the site where we hold Freedom Walk. We are happy that you have joined us for the 24th annual and the second virtual Freedom Walk. We hold the Freedom Walk to raise awareness about the Japanese American experiences during World War II and to protect civil liberties for all Americans. Once again, we've incorporated many program elements from prior years and are especially happy to have Ambassador Tomita from the Japanese Embassy provide a video message. As we mark the 80th anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066, which incarcerated persons of Japanese ancestry, our theme this year is Dissenting Voice to EO 9066, Eleanor Roosevelt. David Woolner is our keynote speaker, and he will talk about her opposition to the executive order and how she tried to convince the president not to sign it. After his remarks, we will have a Q&A session with him. Thank you for taking time to join us today, and please enjoy the program. Good afternoon from the Gulf Coast of Florida. I am Marty Herbert, retired Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, the Japanese American Veterans Association representative to the Freedom Walk Committee. I, along with my fellow Java board member, Mark Nakagawa, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and fellow Ranger, are pleased to once again serve as the honor guard for this great event. At this time, we would like to observe a moment of silence as we think about the great people of Ukraine as they're suffering in their fight for freedom and survival. Now please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by Dr. Noriko Hunter, who will sing the national anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was 
Hello, my name is Ben de Guzman, and I'm proud to serve as the director for the Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs here in Washington, D.C. Today, I'm pleased to represent Mayor Bowser uh, in uh, providing letters, uh, our letter of welcome to the participants of this year's Freedom Walk. Uh, without further ado, then, I'm going to read the proclamation that Mayor Bowser has presented here today. As mayor of Washington, D.C., I am pleased to welcome the participants and organizers of the 24th annual and second virtual National Cherry Blossom Freedom Walk. An official event of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, the Cherry Blossom Freedom Walk seeks to raise awareness of the Japanese American experience during World War II and to highlight the role of all citizens must play in preserving the constitutional rights of all Americans. This year's walk will be especially poignant as it marks the 80th year since the signing of Presidential Executive Order 9066, authorizing the imprisonment of more than 120,000 men, women, and children of Japanese ancestry in internment camps. Under the theme, Dissenting Voice to 9066, Eleanor Roosevelt, this year's event will feature insights and reflections on Eleanor Roosevelt's opposition to EO 966 uh, by resident historian of the Roosevelt Institute, David B. Wollner. Thank you for your tireless service and for giving leadership to this important time of education, reflection, and action. On behalf of the nearly 700,000 residents of Washington, DC, you have my best wishes for an enjoyable and productive event. Signed, Muriel Bowser, Mayor, Washington, D.C. Hello, I'm Diana Mayhew, President of the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this program today. We are honored to have had a long-standing relationship with the Freedom Walk Committee. This event has been an official event of the festival since 2001. This year, we're so thankful to be able to honor the 110th anniversary of the gift of these beautiful cherry trees, bringing back festival traditions and presenting new collaborations and experiences live and in person. The National Cherry Blossom Festival, as springtime in the cherry trees themselves, symbolizes hope, renewal, and new beginnings. The trees, a gesture of goodwill from Tokyo to Washington, D.C., now more than ever, serves as a reminder to us of the importance of unifying communities and sharing the celebration of peace and international friendship. On behalf of the Board of Directors and staff, we invite you to be part of this annual tradition and rediscover spring. The festival celebration starts at your doorstep, extending to neighborhoods, surrounding areas. We invite you to explore on your own art in bloom, cherry blossom sculptures, and art walk installations. Participate with your neighbors at featured parks with local kite flies, or even join the traditional signature events such as opening ceremony, blossom kite festival, parade, petalpalooza and fireworks, as well as those events produced by festival partners, including the Japan America's Sakura Matsuri Japanese Street Festival, and so much more during these fun four filled weeks. Many of these events will also be live streamed or taped for later viewing. For a full schedule of events and programs, and to get the most updated information on the Bloom Watch, or even the ability to view blooming in real time, visit Bloom Watch on our website. The festival is honored to partner with the Trust for the National Mall to help drive support to care for these iconic and most beloved cherry trees we celebrate each year. We invite you to support these efforts through the Trust's Adopt a Cherry Tree program, assisting the National Park Service in their efforts. For more information, go to nationalmall.org. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the 2022 Festival Goodwill Ambassadors an annual program of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, selecting young adults whose passion it is to learn about and share Japanese culture and language. Hello, 
My name is Matthew Lee. I wanted to become a goodwill ambassador because I am interested in furthering cultural relations between the United States and Japan. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Lee. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown University and I became a goodwill ambassador because I was excited for the chance to be able to connect with people and to be able to build community, especially through something as iconically DC as the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Hi, I'm Chris Snyder, and I'm one of this year's Goodwill Ambassadors. Um, I wanted to be a Goodwill Ambassador because I'm currently studying Japanese-American relations, and I also just really wanted to be a part of this year's festival, and I really hope together we can all make this year's festival like one of the best ever. So, thank you so much! Hi, I'm Riku Kamishige, and I'm honored to be a Goodwill Ambassador because as a fifth generation Japanese American, I'm honored to be able to celebrate the history of US-Japan relations through the giving of cherry trees. Good afternoon. 110 years ago, as a gift of friendship, the mayor of Tokyo donated 3,000 cherry trees to the people of the United States. Over the years, those cherry trees have blossomed into a huge Mount Week display of Japanese friendship. I don't believe there is anything like it elsewhere in the world. To me, the Freedom Walk has always been one of the most moving events of the entire National Cherry Blossom Festival as a powerful reminder to the importance of freedom. This spring, the event is even more significant as we slowly emerge out of the shadow of pandemic, which has put so much strain on life for so long. As we witness the brutal violation of freedom in Ukraine, which shows no sign of abating at the time of this recording. And above all, because this year also marks the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, the heavy-handed order that inflicted grave injustice upon Japanese Americans. The lessons we can learn from this event in history and not confined to Americans only. To us Japanese, it is part of the unfortunate past to which we have given deep reflection over the years. These lessons matter to all who believe in liberty and freedom. They matter today and they will matter for many years to come. This is also a moment to look back to the history of redress by Japanese Americans. I defer, of course, to the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which sought to restore a measure of what had been lost. So today is about the delicacy of blossoms and freedom. It is about the harshness of injustice and it is about the courage of American society to redress wrongs. Delicacy, harshness, courage. These are the things on our mind today. Over the years, my government has put special emphasis on relations with Japanese Americans. The experience of Japanese American is essential to understanding the United States, but is not widely known among today's Japanese people. I regret this and hope we can promote such knowledge and understanding between Americans and the Japanese. There is so much to learn and so much to share. As the Japanese cherry trees have taken root on American soil, so has Japanese friendship. And I thank you for allowing me to be part of this meaningful event. 
Thank you very much. Hi, I'm John Tobe, Chair of the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the mission of the foundation is to preserve the legacy of the Japanese Americans during World War II by honoring their heroic military service. Uh, we are also honoring the 120,000 plus people of Japanese descent who are stripped of their freedom, property, and constitutional rights and educate the wider public of their sacrifices and unjust incarceration. Thank you to the generous support. We are able to fulfill our mission and create programming to ensure that the injustices suffered by the people of Japanese ancestries will never be repeated onto any other group or person. I wanna thank the Freedom Walk Committee for all their tireless work in once again organizing this annual event. We are very proud that the Freedom Walk is one of the kickoff events for the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Thank you all for organizing and participating in this important event. Stay safe and we look forward to greeting you all at the memorial. Hello, my name is Gerald Yamada. I am president of the Japanese American Veterans Association. Java is again proud to be a co-sponsor of the Freedom Walk. Java's mission is to honor and promote the legacy of the Japanese American soldiers who served in World War II. America distrusted Japanese Americans because of their ethnicity. Yet when the call came, they served. They served with honor, uh, personal courage, and exceptional valor. Their gopher broke spirit made them heroes. They created a legacy for us, showing us how to fight prejudice. I see the same gopher broke spirit in those that are defending Ukraine. Faced with overwhelming oppression, they, they like the Nisei soldiers, for love of country, to defend their freedoms and preserve their values are putting themselves in the harm's way. Our prayers are with the people of Ukraine. Sadly, all soldiers do not return from war. Inscribed on the granite walls behind me are the names of almost 800 Japanese Americans who were killed in action. One name is dear to our family. Timothy I. Mizukami, which is here, was killed in action on November 13, 1944. He was a member of M Company 442nd Regimental Combat Team. He is my wife Nancy's uncle. As we celebrate the Freedom Walk, let us remember those Japanese American men and women who served to defend America's freedoms and to restore our rights. And also remember those that gave their life in defending freedom for all Americans. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Harese Tobe and I'm proud to serve as the co-president of the DC chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, along with Linda Sato Adams. On behalf of the JCL DC chapter, we are glad to be here today to honor and recognize the lives and stories of those who fought for our country and those who were incarcerated. As time passes and we move further and further away from World War II and the tragic events which changed the lives of Japanese descendants forever, we must remain vigilant to protect our civil liberties and educate people in our communities to ensure that these injustices are not repeated towards any other group. Thank you to all who voluntarily keep these stories from fading. I wanna thank the Freedom Walk Committee for their thoughtful planning of this event and for inviting the JCLDC chapter to participate. The JCLDC chapter invites you to join us as we are planning many in-person and virtual events for this year. Please visit jcl-dc.org for more information.
Thank you for joining us today. The Freedom Walk is so fortunate to have longtime co-sponsors for this event. We have listed the co-sponsors with their websites. You can get more information on them at your leisure. Thank you to the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation, the Japanese American Veterans Association, the DC chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, and the Ikoji Buddhist Temple for your continued support. Every event relies on volunteers and I want to take a moment to acknowledge them. Thank you to the Freedom Law Committee and the staff of the National Japanese American Memorial Foundation. A special thank you to the production team of Ed Yamanaka, Sam Fuji, Min Nguyen, Megan Bertoni, and to Chris Chan from 3C Strategies for hosting the event today and providing technical assistance. We are recording the program and it will be posted via social media soon. We will now switch to the next portion of our program with our keynote speaker, David B. Wolner, and our guest MC, Ryan Yamamoto, evening news anchor at KPIX in San Francisco. So thank you, Martha. I hope that uh, all of you enjoyed this program. And even though we could not uh, do the walk this year, we hope that with the arrival of spring, you can take a walk around your neighborhood, even venture out to a new neighborhood or park, because as we know, this is the 80th anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066. So as you walk, please take time to reflect on how this executive order impacted your life and the lives of your family. So hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Yamamoto. I'm the main anchor at KPX 5 CBS News Bay Area in San Francisco. I'm a proud Japanese American, third generation Sansei. As a journalist and reporter, I've had the privilege to cover many of the stories that emerged from the Japanese internment camps from the first group of JAs that were rounded up and taken from their homes on the west coast of Bainbridge Island of Washington State to the bravery of the young men who joined the U.S. military and fought in World War II with the 100th Infantry Battalion and 442nd Regimental Combat Team to even more courageous JAs who stood up to the injustice of incarceration like Gordon Hirabayashi and Fred Korematsu. And I've also had the privilege to work on a documentary on a man named Tommy Kono, who went from Thule Lake to become the greatest and the most decorated Olympic and world champion weightlifter of all time. You know, for 80 years, these, these types of stories still emerge from the camps and so many other stories have yet to be told. And even sadder, so many of these stories will never be told. That is why on this 80th anniversary, and 80 years later, it's important to still talk about the history of the internment, to talk about Japanese American history, to talk about our American history. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, David B. Woolner, resident historian, senior fellow, and former executive director of the Roosevelt Institute. This afternoon, he will help continue this conversation of our Japanese American experience, and will share us his reflections on Eleanor Roosevelt, her commitment to protecting civil liberties for all Americans, and in particular, her opposition to the executive order. And after David's remarks, he has graciously agreed to answer questions from you. So please put your questions in that question box, and we'll get to as many of those questions as time permits. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand it over to our keynote speaker, Mr. David B. Wolner. Thank you, Ryan. It's a great pleasure to be here. If we could have the first slide, please. I want to, uh, first of all, thank uh, the National Japanese American Association or Foundation, the Japanese American Veterans Association, and the um, American Citizens League uh, for the honor of speaking with you today. I also want to extend a special thank you to uh, Martha Watanabe for inviting me to speak today, and also to my friend Mary Dolan of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee for putting uh, Martha in touch with me. It is really a, a real honor to be asked to speak today on this 80th anniversary of the executive order that uh, Franklin Roosevelt signed um, in uh, 1942. Roughly six years ago, in response to a series of anti-Muslim comments perpetrated by a leading candidate for the presidency in 2016, I wrote an op-ed urging the nation's leaders to take a stronger action to counter the climate of hate and fear that seemed to have gripped the country in the wake of 9-11 attacks. As we all know, incidents of xenophobia and nativism 
in response to crises are all too common in American history. And sadly, in the wake of the pandemic that erupted just over two years ago, the current scapegoat for the health crisis that has gripped the nation are Asian Americans. In fact, just two weeks ago, the Stop Asian Hate Coalition announced that there have been over 10,000 anti-hate incidents, anti-Asian hate incidents reported in the United States since the start of the pandemic, including, of course, the horrific murder of Michelle Alisa Go at the Times Square subway station in January. In light of this, it seems that the editorial I wrote against anti-Muslim hate could just as easily be published today, particularly because of the inspiration, particularly because the inspiration for the opera had stemmed from Eleanor Roosevelt's opposition to the same sort of hatred and xenophobia that ultimately led her husband to issue the executive order that resulted in the forced relocation and an incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese Americans during the Second World War. The incident that led uh, Eleanor Roosevelt to issue this warning of or about the dangers uh, of falling into a state of fear and bigotry, of course, uh, was the sudden Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Get up the next slide, please. Fearful that the uh, sudden assault on American soil might lead to a violent reaction against Japanese German and Italian Americans, Eleanor Roosevelt published a remarkable editorial in her widely syndicated My Day column that made clear her opposition to the notion that Japanese Americans and aliens represented any sort of threat to American security. What makes her column all the more remarkable is that it was published on December 16th, 1941, less than 10 days after Japan's devastating attack on Pearl Harbor, at a time when the Japanese army was furiously advancing on Malaya and the Philippines, and when Hitler's armies had overrun all Europe and stood a mere 25 miles from the center of Moscow. And yet, in spite of all of this, Eleanor Roosevelt had the courage to challenge the American people not to give in to their fears. We could get the next slide, please. She had just returned from uh, a trip to the West Coast, as you can see here, there's a photograph for, uh, taken from the New York Times meeting with Japanese Americans in Tacoma, Washington in, in December of 1941. She had just returned from a trip to the West Coast where she bore witness to the apprehension and rising hatred many of her fellow citizens had directed towards Americans of Japanese uh, descent. Given that we had suddenly found ourselves thrust into a global war, some of the anxiety that the American people were feeling at this moment was understandable. But ER was confident, as she wrote in this My Day column, in the ability of the FBI and Secret Service to ferry out, ferret out any German, Italian, or Japanese agents who might represent a threat to the United States. You can have the next slide. And she calmly advised her American fellow Americans to report any suspicious activity to the proper authorities. Here's a draft of the uh, editorial that she wrote and then published uh, on December 16th. And in that editorial, she also cautioned her fellow citizens, quoting now, not to forget the, quote, great mass of our people stemming from these various national ties must not feel that they have suddenly ceased to be Americans. Indeed, she went on, how the American people respond to this crisis represents perhaps the greatest test this country has ever met. Americans, after all, come from all nations of the world, she said. And as some of us have remarked, we must not, uh, we may be the only proof that different nationalities could live together in peace and understanding, each bringing his own contribution, different though it may be, to the final unity, which is the United States, unquote. And then in words that powerfully resonate in today's climate of fear and hate, she admonished the American people not to forget the unique role that the United States can and must play at this critical moment. For if, she went on, out of the present chaos, there is ever to come a world where free people live together peacefully in Europe, Asia, or in the Americas, we shall have to furnish the pattern. She certainly understood in a planet striven by hatred and war, and in a nation which more than any other represented all humankind, that this task would not be easy. And then she said, perhaps on us today lies the obligation 
to prove that such a vision may be pract a practical possibility. If we cannot meet the challenge of fairness to our own citizens of every nationality, of really believing in the Bill of Rights and of making it a reality for all loyal American citizens, regardless of race, creed, or color, if we cannot keep in check anti-Semitism, anti-racial feelings, as well as anti-religious feelings, then we shall have removed from the world one real hope for the future on which all humanity must now rely." Unquote. Eleanor Roosevelt was correct when she observed that America's response to the terrible events of December 9th, 7th, 1941 represented one of the greatest tests the American people ever faced. And unfortunately, as we all know, the United States did not live up to that test. We could have the next slide, please. Here is a copy of her Mind Day address, and then the next slide. Um, in the Roosevelt Library, you can find a number of documents uh, that shed a great deal of light on what took place uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor and in the early months of uh, 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 January and February of 1942. And the fear that the war inspired, coupled with the forces of racism and racial profiling, uh, led the War Department and many, many members of Congress to press Franklin Roosevelt to sign the executive order that allowed the War Department to essentially imprison and incarcerate well over 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent living on the West Coast. And in this memo, uh, uh, Assistant to the Attorney General James Rowe uh, warns FDR about what he called the, the uh, racial uh, tension that had erupted that he said could explode at any moment on the West Coast. Today, virtually all historians and legal scholars agree that FDR's decision to allow the internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War was a grievous error, a clear violation of their human rights and constitutional rights, an unfortunate response to the kind of war hysteria that gripped the country, especially among citizens of the West Coast, as this memo attests in the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack. We could have the next slide, please. And we should remember uh, in light of this, particularly in light of the post 9-11 calls, as you may recall, to quote, register or ban Muslim, register Muslims or ban Muslim immigration to the United States. We should remember in that case that FDR's Justice Department opposed the idea of the incarceration of uh, Japanese Americans on constitutional ground. And as you can see in this memo, which uh, I placed on the screen, that the FBI reported, quote, no evidence of fifth column activities among the Japanese American community at this time. But the hysteria of the moment and the irresponsible behavior of such noted journalists of Walter Lippmann, who was a very famous journalist at the time, editorialist, who took up the evacuation cry on the grounds that, quote, uh, the widespread fear of sabotage was intimate, uh, he wrote in one editorial at the time, uh, moves like this led a furious uh, Attorney General Bill to liken uh, Lippmann's editorial to shouting fire in a crowded theater. Uh, these sorts of uh, actions and hysteria and pressure from the War Department ultimately led the president to give in to the, to the very fear he had so eloquently cautioned uh, us not to embrace as he first took the oath of office 10 years before, of course, when he urged the American people that the only thing they had to fear was fear itself in his first inaugural address. Once the order was signed, of course, Eleanor Roosevelt remained unequivocal in her opposition to the, the, the plan to incarcerate Japanese Americans. But once FDR had signed the order, she found herself caught between her responsibility as first lady not to speak out against her husband's policies in public and her private conviction that the decision was wrong. Um, we could have the next slide, please. Uh, a couple of photographs that I found uh, in the FDR Library archives uh, earlier this week uh, of uh, the process, the beginning process of internment. As it became clear, however, uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt and many others always believed that the Japanese community in the United States posed no threat whatsoever to national security, and that any charges of disloyalty were absolutely basis, baseless, she began to take action. In April of 1943, she made a highly 
highly publicized visit to the Gila River uh, Detention Center in Arizona, making sure that she was photographed in the presence of internees, a powerful gesture given the endemic racism at the time. Get up the next slide, please. Here she is visiting the uh, Gila River. And then there's another slide. If we could have that, please. And you can see uh, here uh, leaving the, the facility, uh, being photographed uh, with members of the uh, internment camp. ER also urged her husband, FDR, to meet with the director of the War Relocation Authority, who by this point was also pushing for the release of the uh, detainees. And in an inter interview with the Los Angeles Times at the end of that month, publicly stated her view that the sooner the camps were closed, the better. If we could have the next slide, please. She also published an article in Collier's Magazine in October of 1943, in which she stated in reference to the way that Japanese Americans had been treated, quote, and let's go, uh, let me explain this slide. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the techniques that Eleanor Roosevelt used uh, during her uh, uh, publication of, of issues that she felt strongly about was to be photographed um, in controversial uh, settings. And I know it's hard to believe, but just for the first lady of the United States to be photographed with Japanese Americans at the internment camp, or with uh, African Americans here at the Tuskegee Institute in 1941 was con controversial. This is a wonderful photograph that was taken after Eleanor Roosevelt had taken a ride in, uh, in uh, a training aircraft with one of the Tuskegee pilots, uh, which she wrote about and publicized in her My Day column. Uh, and of course, which ultimately spurred her husband uh, to allow the Tuskegee Airmen to fly combat missions in the Second World War. Much like the 442nd Regiment, they ended up being one of the most decorated uh, and, and courageous uh, air squadrons uh, of the entire war. So this was a standard technique that she used uh, to try to move the American public forward on issues like race. All right, so if we could go to the next slide. As I was mentioning, she also published, uh, in addition to the Los Angeles Times uh, piece, which as you can see here, um, uh, she was front page news um, uh, on the law, uh, in the Los Angeles Times, large photograph there with the article uh, where she said, the, the sooner the camps were closed, the better. Uh, and then she published this article in Collier's Magazine, if we could have the next slide, in October of 1943, uh, where in reference to the way Japanese Americans had been treated, she said, quote, that to undo a mistake is always harder than to not create one originally. It's quite an extraordinary article. She doesn't come right out and categorically state her opposition. Uh, this would be something that uh, it would be uh, unacceptable for her to do given her position vis-a-vis uh, -vis her husband. But anybody who reads this article make, it's, makes it quite clear that, that she's opposed to this idea and thinks that the camp should be closed uh, as soon as, as, as possible. Uh, and she also states repeatedly that Japanese Americans should not be treated any differently than German Americans or Italian Americans and so forth. But to call a German American uh, a German is, is uh, just as absurd as calling an Italian American Italian or Japanese American uh, Japanese. So when we take this together uh, and, and look at this, uh, the sad truth, however, is that in spite of these and other efforts, the gradual release of, 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 and the gradual release of a limited number of internees, it would not be until mid-December 1944 that the exclusion order was finally lifted. I think there's a lesson in, in this history for all of us about what it means to be American, about the nature of, and meaning of, of freedom, and, then, and the unique role that the United States can play in the world if we have the courage to reject fear and live up to the values that we have inspired millions of people the world over, to embrace the vision that is America in the hope of a better life for themselves and for their children. It is this vision, after all, that has uh, that led millions of Americans to fight and die for the cause of freedom in the Second World War, a vision so powerful that it inspired thousands of Japanese Americans to enlist in the American army even as their families were interned, as was mentioned, uh, particularly in the largely uh, uh, too often forgotten 442nd Regiment, which was 
uh, widely regarded as one of the most decorated combat units of its for its size and length of service in uh, American military history. So considering all of this, I think it's important that we not forget, therefore, that as we struggle with a, a renewed rise of racism and xenophobia, that our greatest strength and what distinguishes us most from those to seek us harm us uh, is not our military might, but our belief in equality before the law and our deep commitment, indeed our obligation, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, quote, to meet the challenge of fairness to citizens, to our citizens of every nationality, regardless of race, creed, or color, and not to give in to anti-religious feelings or anti-racist feelings, but to remain the one real hope for the future on which all humanity was, must now rely. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. So David, that was fascinating, a new insight into Eleanor Roosevelt and the history of Executive Order 9066. Uh, as a reminder to everyone uh, who have tuned in, so please put your questions into that question box and we'll get to as many questions uh, as possible. But I actually have a few questions of my own uh, just to kind of start off with. Uh, for Eleanor Roosevelt, at that time, how groundbreaking was it for a first lady at that time to go out and put herself out there and, and make these type of statements. Uh, was there any, was she the first to, to do that? Uh, yes, th she was the first. This was absolutely unprecedented. Um, and I think we we uh, sometimes tend to forget that, uh, that you know, it's uh, the other thing that's rather extraordinary is that her, her husband, the president, let her do this. Um, I, I think there is a, many in the public who who might think that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was sort of a loose cannon that did what she wanted and, uh, you know, uh, disregarded the fact uh, of her position being married to the President of the United States, but uh, they were actually very close political advisors, and he had a great deal of respect for her, and he didn't try to stifle her from doing what she felt was uh, right in her own conscience. So it's a rather curious and unusual situation where she would go out and, and, and you know, uh, go as far as making those kinds of statements. Um, um, in, in 1943, um, and really trying to push the the political agenda um, in terms of closing the camps, et cetera. But there's no question, she was absolutely unprecedented. No one had ever, um, uh, no first lady had ever taken on such a large public role before. And, you know, there were a whole host of issues that she, uh, and causes that she embraced uh, from uh, this one that we're talking about today to, of course, uh, issues of racial discrimination uh, and so forth, a refugee crisis from, from Europe, et cetera. Um, and, and she was uh, extremely highly respected. She was probably the most widely respected woman in America at the time and uh, widely read. I mean, she published uh, My Day six days a week for, for 30 plus years. And, and uh, we get a question from Paul and Lou, uh, and it's kind of on, on, on uh, following up on my question, but the question is, how did Eleanor Roosevelt influence the, the next first ladies who followed her? Uh, did her activism inspire other first ladies? Well, she wasn't without controversy. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, not not unlike Hillary Clinton's experience. Um, um, you know, again, may, people may be surprised, but there was talk of Eleanor Roosevelt running uh, for the Senate, uh, even running for president when she first resigned. It wasn't it wasn't something that was, uh, uh, you know, all over the papers, so to speak, but it, it wasn't uh, beyond the realm of possibility. And it was something that was out there in the public mind. Um, she also played a very important role at the beginning of the United Nations, uh, because, of course, her husband was the chief architect of the, U the creation of the UN, and Harry Truman recognized that uh, for him to nominate Eleanor as one of the first delegates to, uh, 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 among the first delegation in the United States to the United Nations, would help give that institution a great deal of credibility. Um, and so she was deeply involved in, in the founding of the UN in its first years, and of course, deeply involved in some of the critical issues like the displaced persons that were uh, um, living in, in DP camps in World War II and Europe and so forth. And also, of course, she chaired the committee that ultimately drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, another question from uh, Tara. 
Was it common knowledge at the time that Japanese Americans in the U.S. were no danger to the U.S. security, or was war, fear, and hysteria, people, did they just dis dis discounted it? I think they largely discounted it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it's a racial question because I don't think uh, German Americans or Italian Americans, uh, although again, you know, the FBI was was um, was on top of trying to figure out who was, uh, uh, particularly among the alien population, who might be a threat and who wasn't. Uh, and they did arrest a, a number of people uh, in the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack: uh, German Americans, Japanese Americans, and Italian Americans. But as you saw from that memo, after that initial sort of sweep. Uh, uh, the FBI and, and J. Edgar Hoover uh, unequivocally said that there was no evidence of any uh, um, danger among the Japanese American community, that they had they had uh, rounded up anybody who was suspicious and they felt quite confident about that. So there really was no grounds uh, for the, this whole incident. Um, as I said, it was largely racially driven. And what, what distinguished the Japanese, of course, was uh, their color. Um, and um, the fact that they were a different race. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a terrible testament to this uh, xenophobia and kind of a nativism that emerges periodically throughout American history and sadly, you know, continues in some cases to this day. I'm curious, did, as, as we focus on Eleanor Roosevelt, can you share any insights into um, FDR's mindset about the executive order. Did, did he have any reservations about this? Yeah, that's a very tough question. And I thought about this mm -hmm. uh, uh, myself. Uh, I will confess that thanks to the pandemic, the Roosevelt archives have been closed for the last two years. And I got my first chance to go back into the records just yesterday, <laughs> um, literally. Um, but my, my sense is, um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was very, uh, he kept his, as we say sometimes, kept his, his cards close to his chest. Um, and this is one issue where he, he, there really is very little evidence one way or the other. Um, you know, he, there just really isn't much to, to, uh, to try to figure out whether or not he uh, had any kind of regrets whatsoever. I will say that like a lot of his generation, um, including Theodore Roosevelt, um, there, there was suspicion of Japan as a kind of aggressor nation in Asia. And I think that played a part of a role in his willingness to, to do this. Um, but frankly speaking, that it's really hard to know. Um, there just isn't, there isn't much evidence that I've been able to find or see uh, after the actual order was issued as to whether or not he himself uh, felt any sense of regret. Uh, about this. Part of the problem, of course, is that, um, you know, he, he was completely overwhelmed with the war. And um, there isn't a lot of time for reflection. Um, and, you know, he's got so many things coming at him. Um, but it is interesting that he didn't try to stop Eleanor Roosevelt from doing what she did in 1943. Um, but even there, I can't, I have not been able to find any, any written communication between the two of them concerning that issue. Uh, this is a question from Vincent, and, and you had mentioned this in, in your talks, and, and I think he's just looking for more clarification. So what groups or factions advocated for Executive Order 9066? What was the War Department's position on the Executive Order? They wanted it. Um, you know, I, I, the, one of the things that, one of the most fascinating things about this is um, when you look at uh, the, the, there are people who did reflect later on, James Rowe, for example, uh, in the testimony that he gave to Congress in the early 1980s. And, um, you know, this is not an excuse, but one, one gets the sense that in the chaos and, and fast moving events that were occurring at, after Pearl Harbor in the early months, or even weeks, really, of, of, um, of 1942, that there was this issue about protecting and remember there was a there was a sense even uh following pearl harbor that you know there might be an invasion there, there were erroneous reports of sinkings of american ships between san diego and pearl harbor which turned out to be false but you know in this war hysteria um the uh war department began to advocate um 
creating exclusion zones around military facilities. And the problem was that events move so quickly that, you know, if you start talking about creating exclusion zones and excluding a particular group of people, in this case, Japanese Americans, it's kind of snowballed. And, and, and uh, between the, the racial uh, agitation among uh, people on the West Coast, in particular in California, anti-racial uh, Asian uh, uh, racism that went on, um, and this, this uh, kind of war hysteria environment, the idea of exclusion became larger and larger and larger until, fun, until ultimately the, it, the, advocate, the decision was, well, we'll move this entire population off the West Coast itself. Um, and um, it really was the War Department that was pushing this. Uh, the Justice Department was unequivocal in its opposition. In that same memo, um, uh, in a different memo that I looked at yesterday, uh, Attorney General B Biddle literally said, we want nothing to do with this. Um, you know, almost trying to distance the Justice Department from what the War Department was doing um, on the clear grounds that it was unconstitutional. But the other side of the story, and this is the sad part, is that they really didn't kind of marshal their arguments. It, you, you get the sense, I mean, there, there aren't a whole lot of pieces of paper on this. It's just a kind of fast moving situation where there's a few comments and a, and a few um, meetings here and there where these kinds of issues come up, but it's it's like a snowball that's just getting out of control. And um, and so sadly, um, ultimately Roosevelt decided to sign that order. And after that, as I said, um, it's not an issue that he really addresses. Mm -hmm. This question comes from Marty and curious, did Eleanor Roosevelt stand, did her stand have any impact on the formal apology and the reparation payments uh, made by President Reagan? Uh, yes, I think it did. Um, you know, uh, not something that Ronald Reagan might want to admit too often, but he did vote for Roosevelt four times. Um, <laughs> uh, he did have a lot of respect for the, uh, the leadership that Franklin Roosevelt uh, exhibited during the Second World War. And um, I think in amongst that, uh, he would have respect. He had respect for uh, the position that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt took on issues of race and so forth. Um, and so I think, um, to me, it, it, there's no question that that she, in a sense, um, provided, in a way, she provided a, a kind of cover for people who were objecting to this, uh, even during the 40s itself. You know, for the first lady of the United States to indicate, as she as she did in those articles that this was um, a mistake. Um, uh, I think, you know, of, of all the people that could do so, she would have been the most prominent. And even though she did it in a very guarded way, and I don't think we should misunderstand this, this was very common of Eleanor Roosevelt. She, she didn't push these issues, you know, she, it's almost as if uh, she didn't try to challenge people's prejudices per se, but she said, in spite of your prejudice, this is still wrong. You know, it, it's a very kind of e, uh, even handed, almost subtle sort of pushing. Uh, and the photographs are a part of that technique and on a whole bunch of issues, including uh, refugee immigration during the 1930s and, and race issues and so forth. So, but in doing so, you know, she, if Eleanor Roosevelt is, is saying this, it provides uh, ins inspiration for other people to speak out in other positions of power and authority. And I think that that really did have an impact, particularly uh, later on um, when the ultimate decision was uh, taken to issue the apology and provide the reparations. And, and this question's from Laura. Her taking that very public stand, was there ever a concern that this would hurt uh, FDR politically? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure there, there was, but at this point he's in the, he's, you know, he's, He's a, uh, the, the, the election that was really the critical one was 1940. That was the one that was the most controversial. His decision to run for a third term as opposed to a fourth term um, was, the, was the very uh, unprecedented move. By the time we get to 1944, 
we're so deep into the war and he's so much uh, associated with wartime leadership that nobody was surprised when he ultimately decided to run for a fourth term. And I think part of what uh, I write about in uh, the book that I published recently, The Last 100 Days, is how he came to that decision and, and the impact that that decision for the fourth term had on his uh, legacy. But um, there, there, you know, there are always political considerations uh, when it comes to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he is a political operator. Um, but, you know, again, there, this is not an issue that he, he reflected on a great deal. So it's difficult to say. Mm. Um, it, it is true that he wanted to avoid controversy and controversial issues. And it may have been that he decided not to uh, issue the, the formal lifting of the order until December 44, because that was well after the election. But we don't have any hard evidence yet to, to say one way or the other. But that's certainly within the realm of possibility. I'm sad to say. Mm. Uh, Shirley's asking, did Eleanor visit uh, other internment camps besides Gila River? I don't believe so. I looked at that uh, this week and um, I, I don't think that's the case. Okay, and then uh, Sumiko asks, and I'm gonna kind of read this a little bit long question. Uh, connected to the discussion about FDR and Executive Order 9066, I've seen a quote Americanism is not and never was a matter of race or ancestry. Uh, Division of Public Inquiries Office of War Information, February 3rd, 1943. The caption to the war poster with this quote is credited to FDR. Do you know if this was FDR's idea or someone else in the administration or military? Uh, did Eleanor Roosevelt respond to this idea? I can't say for certain. Um... Uh, what the origin of that is, if it's from a war poster, it, it wouldn't surprise me that if this was FDR. Um, again, you know, I think we have to understand that this was a particular um, blind spot that he had. Um, his willingness to go along with this idea, uh, his willingness to intern Japanese Americans um, is really the blackest mark on, uh, on his presidency. And um, you know, this is a man who could say something like that and at the same time sign that executive order, unfortunately. And so there, you know, even to this day, as I said, there is um, still some question about why he was willing to do this and why he, you know, given the evidence that he was subsequently provided and so forth, uh, didn't reverse that decision. Uh, but again, I have to, I have to be honest, you know, one of the things that I, that I found really striking reading the testimony from uh, 1980s from James Rowe. He, you know, he, he said, we just didn't fight hard enough. We were so busy with so many things. We didn't really organize this correctly. We didn't really get the message through. We should have gotten through. This was un unacceptable and unconstitutional. You know, there are a few references to it, but you almost get a sense that, as I said, it was kind of a snowballing effort. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he de definitely regretted that uh, the Justice Department didn't work harder to make this point to FDR. Um, but, uh, you know, again, so I, as I said, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if, if uh, Roosevelt uh, wrote that statement, but, uh, you know, that's a statement from a man who unfortunately nevertheless signed this order in any case. Mm -hmm. And a question from John, do you know if any of the Roosevelt children were able to share of their personal knowledge regarding 9066 and the relationship between FDR and, and Eleanor? Uh, I'm not sure about the Roosevelt children. I do know, um, and I should mention that the Roosevelt Institute, which has every year gives out medals called the Four Freedoms Awards, and the highest one is called the Freedom Medal, that last year in 2021, they ordered, uh, they issued the Freedom Medal uh, to uh, Fred Karamatsu. Uh, posthumously, mm. it was accepted uh, on behalf uh, of uh, him by his daughter um, in a very moving ceremony that was uh, uh, carried out in uh, in the spring of last year, and and where Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, the granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, actually granted the award. Um, so, I, I, I mean, in in terms of the next generation, and certainly the grandchildren, they are unequivocally uh, uh, opposed. Uh, and uh, to to the incarceration of Japanese Americans, there's no question about it. They also see it as a black mark on their grandfather's legacy. Um, but I can't answer the question about the children themselves during the war, whether or not they said anything in opposition uh, to the to the camps. 
And a question from Karen, did Eleanor say anything after the camps were finally closed and did she play a role into President Roosevelt's honoring of the 442nd at the White House? Um, she, you know, she was pretty guarded. Uh, th there are, they, you know, there are soft references to her opposition, but she, she doesn't come out and say, uh, you know, he made a mistake in, in very um, mm -hmm. direct terms. Um, there are more guarded statements that one can interpret much like um, the ones that I just made reference to. Um, um, and I guess perhaps that was out of respect for her husband's legacy or sort of a, a carrying on of this fact that she was in this dilemma of being the first lady um, at the time uh, and not wanting to publicly uh, and directly oppose government policy. Um, although it's difficult to know after, afterwards, of course, um, uh, there would be no reason for her to be so reticent. But I, I have not seen anything where it, it's an actual direct statement, uh, unequivocal statement that this was a mistake on her husband's part, the signing of the order. Um, there's lots of uh, statements that she made about uh, issues such as, you know, racism against Japanese Americans or feeling that Japanese Americans are somehow not Americans and so forth. So she's quite clear on that. Um, the second part of the question. Um, second part of the question, hold on, let me see. Um, did she play a role into President Roosevelt's honoring of the 442nd at the White House? Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it, that, that could well be the case um, mm -hmm. because she had uh, raised these issues uh, with her husband. And again, we, th there may be, have been conversations that we don't know about, um, sure. you know, because uh, not all the communication between them obviously is written down. And uh, one last question, because I think we're going to start wrapping up here. Uh, this is from Julie. She, she asked the question through the chat. Uh, is there any documentation of other women or women's groups who supported her position during that time? Oh, yeah, there were there were many people who supported uh, and there were letters written to the president in opposition to this um, to this uh, decision. Um, and she and she's referred to, I mean, you know, it, that column that I quoted at the beginning of, you know, when you have, again, I think that photograph speaks volumes, the, the, the one that was taken on the 15th of December, you know, she, one of the things that's really interesting is that she was actually an official of the government at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was the, uh, involved in the um, uh, civil defense uh, authority and actually had to resign that position in February of 1942. We won't get into that right now, but it was considered un unacceptable for a first lady uh, to take a government job. Um, but so when she was on the West Coast making that tour, she was actually an official representative of the American government in that case. She wasn't uh, just the first lady. And yet, you know, she made a point of being photographed with Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. which is, that's a very powerful statement. Again, um, you know, I think it's important to, re to remember the context of the time. In today's world, that seems pretty harmless. But in, that, in those days, uh, that was a very powerful thing to do. And, and then you consider the fact that she's actually officially employed and officially part of the Defense Department, and she's making this tour to inspect the defense preparations of the West Coast. And she's meeting with Japanese Americans. And then she publishes a widely syndicated column the next day where she basically says, you know, we can't give in to our fears. These people are Americans. Uh, it's quite clear that her position was uh, what her position was. And, um, and that did inspire many, many people um, and different uh, constituencies across the country to write to the president, to write in opposition to this program and so forth. Um, unfortunately, he didn't listen. Uh, no question that Eleanor Roosevelt was ahead of her time, groundbreaking and an inspiration. So we want to thank you, David, for, for your remarks and answering uh, your, our, all of our questions Some very good questions there. But as we ramp up, uh, you had mentioned uh, your book and we'd like you to give you an opportunity to talk about your recent book, The Last 100 Days, FDR at War and at Peace. Oh, thank you, Ryan. That's kind of you to do that. Um, well, the book is... Uh, uh, comes from a, a long uh, period of um, writing about Roosevelt. And uh, I uh, both this felt that, the, you know, this decision to write in for, to, to, uh, to write this book and, and to um, 
go ahead and uh, and run for a fourth term was really quite extraordinary. He um, he uh, was not well. His health was in was in trouble, uh, and had made the decision to ride run in any case. And I felt that uh, it deserved a special recognition that this effort to run. And uh, let me just make one quick uh, move here. My apologies for that. Um, so he he decided to run, and um, and uh, you know um, was very exhausted, and and uh, and uh, but was very determined to essentially try to establish the United Nations and bring the war through to a conclusion. And uh, it's a rather remarkable period. He's fam He's very famous, of course, for his first hundred days. But uh, I started thinking about what we might think of as the last hundred days, and. Uh, some of the most difficult months of the Second World War. Uh, and, uh, you know, fortunately, he was successful in establishing the United Nations and uh, trying to point the world towards uh, uh, peace uh, after this terrible war. Well, thank you, David. And thank you to everyone who joined us in today. I hope that you enjoyed the second virtual Freedom Walk program. And hopefully next year we can celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Freedom Walk live in Washington, D.C. So everyone have a great weekend. David, thank you very much. Martha, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure.